Hi, and welcome to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money, and investing. I'm your host, Ray Trevison from OTG Capital. We broadcast locally on Radio Northern Beaches and around Australia on the Community Radio Network. I'm really pleased to welcome to the microphone and camera for the first time, uh, Paul Mather from FBT Solutions. Welcome to Dollars and Making Sense. Thanks, Ray. Um, thank you for the welcome. Wonderful. And today we're going to be talking all things fringe benefits tax. And ladies and gents, just to give you a little bit of a background, I'm reading from Paul's bio. Paul has over 25 years of hands-on FBT salary packaging and employment taxes experience. Sounds very dry, but it's not because it's really important stuff. And I must admit, I doing some back reading for this show, I've learned and really gone back over some stuff that I really should pay attention to. So Paul also works closely with accounting firms and not-for-profits to help them do their FBT and salary packaging. And uh, again, Paul is an accomplished trainer and speaker on everything to do with FBT and salary packaging and taxes, employment taxes. So I, I think this is a great opportunity to do a real education piece, Paul. And I think one of the real kickers here is that Paul is also a current member of the Australian Tax Officers, uh, Australian Tax Office Fringe Benefit Tax Stakeholder Group, and he has been on that panel since 2005. So, Paul, I think we're pretty well talking to a subject matter expert on FBT, correct? That's right, yes. I mean, over 25 years experience, you know, and pretty much that's all I do day in, day out. So you develop a, you know, a deep level of knowledge and experience in this particular area what well, i have in this area yes wonderful and, and i guess from that perspective I, I have a cursory knowledge of fbt but it's the kind of thing that i run a small business and i run an investment fund but when it comes to taxes i try and be a little educated and then leave that to my accountant and my chartered accountant and auditors to, to, to look after the rest so let's go back a little bit in time and, and again what is fbt so let's start from bare basics yeah so fbt look if we go back to the start, we go back to 1986. Wow. That's when fringe benefits tax, the fringe benefits tax law was introduced into Australia. And really it was introduced because the income tax law wasn't achieving its objective. Because, and when we talk about FBT, it's important to note we're talking about an employer-employee relationship. And so the income tax law um, is effectively structured in a way to tax the earnings of an employee from their employer, but mm -hmm. really cash earnings, salary and wages. Um, there was provision in the income tax law to tax what we call non-cash fringe benefits, but that wasn't effectively working. Those provisions weren't working. So the FBT law <coughs> was brought in to effectively, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, to effectively tax those non-cash fringe benefits. So then so when we're talking, non-cash fringe benefits exactly what are those kind of things yeah so we're to some extent we're talking about anything that's not salary and wages it's not super it's not dividends um <clears throat> you know we're talking about the private use of a motor vehicle hmm? so the private use of a motor vehicle is where the employer owns or leases a vehicle a motor vehicle and they allow the employee to have private use and private use essentially means taking the vehicle home garaging it at home, you know, and then using it privately. Motor vehicles is a big one. Um, obviously, if you've got a motor vehicle, sometimes um, <clears throat> when going to work, you need to park it somewhere. So car parking is another key benefit. Um, there's 13 categories in the law. You know, we talk 13. <clears throat> we thought we talk about, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. We talk about employee expenses. So when an employee puts in a claim for expenses, they are all what we call non-cash fringe benefits. They're not necessarily all subject to fringe benefits tax, but they are, as a starting point, they are fringe benefits. Um, if the employer helps an employee out with a, who may be going through some financial difficulties and gives them a, a loan, a short-term loan, um, mm -hmm. you know, then that's a fringe benefit. Or it might be that the employer decides they're actually going to write that loan off. Um, that's what we call a debt waiver fringe benefit. Um, okay. Property fringe benefits. We give a gift to an employee. That's a property fringe benefit. You know, the gift might be something small. It might be a bottle of wine, you know, or it could be something more more elaborate. Yeah, I, I must say, in, in the modern era where we hear so much about things like wage theft and 
uh, employees struggling to get you know a fair day's pay for a fair day's work the idea that an employer is giving stuff to an employee sounds rather counterintuitive yet it goes on a lot more than people might think doesn't it it certainly does it certainly does and look for a lot of people who have some knowledge of fbt probably a bit of a generalization but there's there seems to be this acceptance around fbt that it's to do with motor vehicles and it's to do with entertainment but like what you're saying, you know, it extends out much broader than that. You know, I, I, I remember when I used to be a salaried employee, I, I worked for Telstra for a number of years and as an executive in the the uh, in that company, I can remember at that time being offered things like um, a salary sacrifice on things like um, school education, the company vehicle you've you've mentioned but things like gym membership as well came up into the grab are these the kind of things that are still subject to the fringe benefits tax Paul? yeah definitely definitely look <clears throat> the reality is not a lot's changed you know from when the law was introduced um salary packaging became hugely popular overnight um you know, novated lease motor vehicles packaging of other benefits and I guess the, the interaction between the salary packaging and FBT is really because you, you can salary package anything as long as your employer allows it. Right. It's, not a, it's not a right. It's up to the employer whether they allow it. But anything can be salary packaged. But it effectively comes back to what is the FBT treatment on that non-cash fringe benefit. So if it's a motor vehicle, it's concessionally taxed. Um, <clears throat> if it's a, a Qantas lounge membership, it's exempt from FBT. You know, if it's right. health insurance, it's fully subject to FBT. And so there's not a lot of advantage, without getting into the details of packaging, there's not a lot of advantage in packaging a benefit unless there's going to be some upside or saving for the employee. Okay. Now, one of our most popular shows last year was when we invited Frank Drenth, who's a, a tax specialist with IFPA, the Institute of Financial Professionals. And we did a show on FBT and Utes and uh, a, around tradies. And I must admit, when I was doing the research on that, Paul, a lot of the assumptions I made around a, a vehicle and the personal usage, and that's the big thing, the personal usage of, of a tradies vehicle, really, there wasn't a lot of wriggle room. And I'm just wondering, in your day-to-day -day travels, being an FBT specialist, do you still see this as being one of the areas of great misconception in, in FBT law and people's understanding of that law? Definitely, 100%. <clears throat> There's still a big, this big myth that floats around there, uh, out there, that if you have, if you provide a ute to an employee, that it's exempt from FBT, which means, you know, and I didn't mention it earlier, but if, if an employer has an FBT liability, mm -hmm. the employer is the one that has the obligation or liability to pay that money to the tax office. Not the employee, not the worker, but the boss actually has to pay yeah. that FBT. Yeah. And I think that's one of the key messages that came out of that FBT and you show was that I think there are a lot of uh, small businesses out there very, uh, I guess, blind to the fact that they actually have a tax liability to cover this on behalf of their workers, don't they? Yeah, that's right. And it's important that we, yeah, we distinguish between, say, a sole trader with a ute and in a, in a business who employs people who provide use, because that's really where FBT comes in. With a sole trader, um, someone working alone, then there's no FBT type implications there. But certainly if the employee is taking the ute home, is using it after hours, taking it home's all right, driving it back to work's all right. But if they're then using the vehicle after hours or on the weekends to go take the kids to the sports or <clears throat> go camping or fishing, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah, and, and if I remember, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's 200 kilometres a year private usage. Is that still the case? Look, it's the, the tax. There's two ways to look at this. Right. Two ways to, I guess, two ways, I guess we could say, to, to claim the exemption or access the exemption. One is under the FBT law. Um, and what it says there is that you can drive the ute, whether it's single cab, dual cab ute, or a van, drive it from home to work, work to home. Um, and as long as there's private, as long as the private use on that vehicle over and above that driving from home to work, work to home is what's considered minor and frequent and irregular, 
then we can claim exemption. The employer can claim exemption on that ute. But where it gets tricky is what's minor and frequent and irregular. <laughs> That's a very furry term, isn't it? It leaves a lot of interpretation, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Exactly. So we we go to the ATO's interpretation because at the end of the day, they're the ministers of the administrate. They, they undertake the administration of the. And they're probably the, they're probably the final arbiters when it comes to a dispute too. And their view is very narrow. So minor and frequent or irregular is using the vehicle on a couple of occasions across the FBT year to say take some personal rubbish to the rubbish tip or maybe move some furniture. But not doing kids drop off to school on the way to work e every day. I, I was really surprised by that one, but that was the one of the cases that was mentioned. Well, so, but as I said, there's two ways to sort of, you know, um, capture the exemption or claim the exemption. One is that view of the law and that ATO is very narrow view of what's private use. Or the other way, which brings me to your 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 um, point about dropping the kids at school, the other way is under a tax office determination. Oh, so not determination, it's a, it's a guidance statement. Mm -hmm. And under that guidance statement, effectively the minor and frequent or irregular private use has been defined as up to a thousand kilometres for a wholly private purpose for the FBT year, but there cannot be any single return journey more than 200 kilometres. Okay, so that gives them a fair bit of wriggle room then, doesn't it? It does. Gives a bit of, well, <clears throat> a bit of wiggle room, but we're only talking 1,000 kilometres, 20-odd kilometres a week. But what they do include... Yeah, it's not a lot, is it? No. What they do include in that guidance, though, as well, is that the employee hasn't doesn't have to drive their ute directly to work or the shortest trip to work and home again. They can actually divert as long as they don't divert by more than two kilometres. <laughs> and Fair so it means they can use the vehicle. They can drop the kids at school or at the bus stop or housemates at the at their place of work, etc. But you can see where this is leading to, though. Um, you know, whether you're looking at the law or whether you're looking under the practical compliance guidance, you're looking at a lot of record keeping and trying to prove things. I guess, I guess. Well, we're just about halfway through the show. You're here on Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money and investing. I'm really happy to be here at the microphone with Paul Mather from FBT Solutions, and we are talking all things FBT. It's time for a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, and thank you for listening to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly radio program about finance, money and investing on Radio Northern Beaches and nationally on the community radio network around Australia. The views, comments and opinions aired during our program should not be construed or viewed as financial advice. Any commentary is general advice only and does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. You should consider whether the advice is suitable for you and your personal circumstances. If in doubt, you should contact an authorised licensed financial planner. We welcome questions and feedback and you can get in touch with us via our blog, social media channels or email. Please search for Dollars and Making Sense in your favourite podcast platform or check out our blog at otgcapital.com.au forward slash blog. Hi, and welcome back to Dollars and Making Sense, a weekly show about finance, money and investing. I'm your host, Ray Trevison. At the microphone this week, we have Paul Mather from FBT Solutions, and we are talking all things FBT. Now, before we went to the break, ladies and gents, we were talking, Paul, about uh, utes and FBT. And I guess that variability uh, of you know what part of the tax code you do or don't refer to. And I guess it's a good point to now lead into discussion around What's the current state of play with FBT and what's the ATO thinking at this time of year now that we've just clicked over another tax year? Where are they at with FBT? Yeah, look, great question. I mean, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, the tax office announced um, an FBT gap. So each year they announced gaps for different taxes. What does that mean? So it means the gap means how much revenue have they collected Right. This is how much should have they collected? Oh, so they have an estimate of how much FBT they're supposed to collect, and there's yes. and they estimate a tax a, a gap. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that gap is about the the current gap is about one point three billion. 
Now, it's not actually a lot of money to tell it in, in government dollar terms, revenue terms. It's not a lot of money, but as a percentage, it's close to 30% as a gap. Oh, so of the actual revenue target for FBT in total, so there's a 30% shortfall yes. in takings. So most other taxes, when they announce a gap, they tend to be in dollar amounts significantly more, but as a percentage term, they tend to be down into the lower single digits. So compliance becomes a real issue now when you've got a 30% gap. That's the biggest, that's more the issue now that people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's the tax officer's belief. Okay. Well, there's an even, I guess, more startling gap is the fact that, and this is all on the tax officer's website, this is all publicly available information. The tax office estimate there's about 950 odd thousand businesses in Australia who employ people. Right. We've got this employer-employee relationship. Uh -huh. Of that 950,000, only about 10% or so are actually registered for FBT, the fringe benefits tax. And oh. so <clears throat> there's potentially, you know, 800,000 plus businesses out there who should be registered for FBT, but they're not. Now, some of those organisations are legitimately not registered because they just don't provide non-cash fringe benefits or the right. benefits they do provide might be some motor vehicles and it's a closely held company you know mum and dad type company um and the the mum and dad or the as employees they make what's known as financial contributions towards those vehicles so there is no fbt but i would say you know by and large most of those businesses that aren't registered probably should be registered and so when you that's a huge number Usually. Now, is, is that something that the small business owner needs to be aware of, or is that something, for example, given your relationship with IFPA and the, the Institute of Financial Professionals and tax agents, is that something that tax agents should be then notifying their clients? Yeah, look, both. I mean, it, at the end of the day, the obligation for FBT rests with the employer. But obviously the tax agents, you know, and, and the like IFPA and the other bodies play an important role. Um, you know, the tax office acknowledge or, or know that, you know, and are happy that tax agents are very good at engaging with their clients around income tax and GST. Mm -hmm. Their concern is they're not so good at engaging around FBT. But and, do you think, Paul, with given your expertise and your long background, over 25 years of experience around it, do you think that's a case of willful ignorance or just my word, this legislation is very complex? Because when I was reading through the notes, it feels fairly complex. Uh, the level of knowledge required, even by the average punter, is fairly substantial. Is it maybe a bridge too far to expect that everybody is well versed in this, or is that something then that the tax tax agents need to step out and say, "Guys, you need to be taking more attention to this." Or, and I was going to ask this as well: this issue of materiality is it too finicky trying to pick up all these bits of stray revenue? Because I think about you know, I'm a small business owner, but, you know, I do coffees, I do lunches, I do all that kind of stuff. And it's legitimate because I don't have a regular office. But <clears throat> that being said, am I going to be picked up for FBT for this, that and the other? Because it would take hours and hours and hours of accounting to collect this for not a huge amount of tax. Is it worth the trade off here? Or is the tax office sort of saying, Maybe that 30% non-compliance makes sense because it's too hard to, to do. Am I reading it right? Look, I understand where you're coming from. And, and <clears throat> I think it's a very valid concern or observation. Mm -hmm. The law is very complicated. And so there is a little bit of this, I think, look, it's, just, it's all too hard. I don't know what to do. And <clears throat> tax agents, I mean, is there, is there any tax agent who's working part time? You know, they're all working full time and extra hours. They're all overworked, just trying to cope with what they've got. Right. Um, and so then trying to add effectively what is another service to their practice, you know, a service in terms of FBT and understanding the rules, et cetera. Um, and this is why we get accounting firms coming to us all the time because, we, you know, we, we deal with it day in, day out. You know, they're dealing with income tax and bazers and things day in, day out. We don't deal with that. We just deal with FBT. Um, but but tell me, Paul, then, is this something that, from your perspective, that you can do sort of a sort of a boilerplate, you know, a, a one size fits all kind of thing that you tick box kind of 
checklist stuff off to you know small medium businesses that say here are the things you need to be aware of because again reading your background notes i guess whenever i see audit and ato i start going uh oh here we go um it, 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 i never ever see the ato you know necessarily going through with their threats of auditing because it takes an awful lot of manpower and so this self this reliance on self regulation still is there and so you know i've got here the ato have extended the random inquiry program to FBT and employer obligations. How, is there a lot of teeth to that? Yeah, look, there is. They are conducting audits. Um, I sort of feel that they're doing enough to create that ripple effect. All oh, right, so there's, yeah. if the people are fearful. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's like, you know, changing the conversation. You know, the amount of times over the years people have said, oh, I don't know, my brother-in-law told me that, you know, the ATO don't audit or they don't worry about FBT or you know utes are utes are exempt you know or i heard it on the golf course or you know someone says oh, i heard when i was at the, the the hair hair salon or the hairdressers you know no, no one pays fbt um mm, and that's it's just dangerous like, isn't it <laughs> yeah so it's you know it's it's to a large extent it's off the radar and i think what the tax mm. office are doing is moving it onto the radar but really they they want that team of tax agents those thousands of tax agents around the country to be part of that team and get the to, message out yeah. yeah and to engage but i guess it only takes uh, i used to refer when i lived on uh, property when i was growing up the old man used to tell me if you ever want to scare foxes off you hang up one pelt up on the fence line and that scares all the other foxes off similar kind of anecdote i guess and again reading your notes i, I i'd like to move on to the key interactions now between fbt and other taxes and some of these key areas so Again, if you can inform us, what are reportable fringe benefits? What does that mean? Yeah, so, and look, this is a really important one because the FBT return, the liability, that's the employer's obligation. They've got to lodge the return, pay the tax. But they also have an obligation to report what's known as reportable fringe benefits mm -hmm. um, onto the employee's annual income statement. And so that, that information that, or that amount goes on to the employee's income statement. So that's comprised of the fringe benefits that have been provided during the year. And it's a grossed up amount. It isn't the value of the fringe benefits, it's a grossed up amount. And then effectively that information goes towards the employees or that which as an individual in their income tax return, calculating their adjusted taxable income, which then has all sorts of ramifications with Centrelink, you know, child support, student debts family tax benefits i'm Obviously. curious paul given that we've now got a, a high level of um software integration with accounting and the like and you know programs like quicken and reckon and, and zero etc um and stp um single touch payroll is, is that the kind of thing now that people should expect that if there is an fpt gross up in other words there is some value of income attached to their yearly tax that's auto filled or is that something that they still need to go back and start talking to their to their bosses about look the <clears throat> it, it is by and large a manual process it's preparing mm. the fpt return but then it's then it's you know entering that um, including that information as part of the stp reporting Right. Um, so it is done through that way. But yeah, things don't happen sort of automatically as such. But this is where, you know, it's very risky for employers from the perspective. If the employer isn't doing the right thing in terms of FBT, well, that's their problem. But right. it becomes a bigger problem if they are found out and then they have to go back in time, prepare some returns going back a few years. Mm -hmm. Then they have to notify their employees or it could be former employees to say, Look, we previously told you your reportable amount was zero, but we, you know, we uh, we stuffed up, and you've got to tell the tax that you made more money, and you've got to pay tax on it. And you've got to go not so much pay tax, but it becomes a, more of a Centrelink type issue. Oh, um, right. and then it's like saying, well, your reportable was we told you it was nil. It's actually forty thousand, but that means then the individual, you know, has to go and amend their already lodged personal income tax return. Yeah, I, I must admit, because I, I run payroll for my own small business, there's big signs now coming up on my software going, it's not easy to revert these things. So, you know, once you put your pay, you know, they're sort of going, are you sure this is correct? And I, I guess in the same light, um, I, I think a bit of forward planning and a little bit of research can save a lot of heartache down the path, right? 
Definitely, definitely. And look, that's just the reportables. I mean, you know, the, the grossed up value of fringe benefits that come from preparing your FBT return, they need to be included in your calculation of taxable wages for assessing how much payroll tax you have to pay. Also for assessing your work cover premiums. So look, Paul, we're just about out of time and I always like to leave our listeners with some key takeaways. Given that, you know, we are around that uh, end of tax time and even though the FBT tax year is actually slightly different, it's actually three months behind, what are some key takeaways that you think the listeners should should be concerned with listening to this show about FBT? Firstly, I'll say FBT is ahead three months ahead. <laughs> three. Oh, my apologies. It's yeah. it's done. It's done before. It's done yeah. on the yeah. quarter. Yeah. yeah, my apologies. Well, I've always had this banter around FBT versus income tax, so I had to throw that. Gotcha. In. No, no, yeah. that's fine. Look, a key takeaway. One key takeaway is if you're in business, if you employ people. If you have motor vehicles registered in your business name mm -hmm. and you're not registered for FBT, have a good, long, hard think about your FBT obligations because <clears throat> the tax office has access to all of this information. Oh, yeah. This is what they use as the starting point for audits. So they have access to e-tag data, toll data, all those sorts of things as well. So um, motor vehicles are pretty hard things to hide when it comes to non-cash fringe benefits. <laughs> so that's probably my takeaway. If you've got motor vehicles, think FBT and think about, you know, uh, do we have, but don't just think about the motor vehicles. As I said, there's 13 categories. So, you know, what other non-cash fringe benefits are we providing? Okay. So ladies and gents, if you are in that situation, have a chat. Paul, I think it'd be great to have you back to talk a little bit more about some other FBT uh, matters. Certainly salary packaging is something that uh, we could spend some time on as well. Paul Mather from FBT Solutions, thanks so kindly for being on Dollars and Making Sense. Thank you, Ray. Great to be here.